I knew I wanted to do something physical with my hands. I wanted to do an art form. I had already been drawing a fair bit, but I had been working in a job that wasn't very rewarding. And when I sat down and started to learn and work doing things with Clay, I just thought, oh, this is great, this is so lovely. And I lost myself in it. So I'm going to throw a mug. <laughs> <laughs> the basic pot of all. <laughs> If I have been out of the studio for a bit, I'll make a whole row of them. And over the course of, say, 20 on a board, they are actually starting to get there. It, it, it is interesting that you can't just immediately sit and make something. It's in that rhythm of making numbers um, that you become more aware of, of uh, a form. It's a responsive material and it's a direct relationship between you and the material. So it's not a paint with a paint where you've got a distance. It's actually, you're actually touching the material you're making something with. So if you press a little bit, it gives a little response. If you press a lot, it gives a lot of response. And so you're starting to have this dialogue between you and a material, and that's pretty exciting. certain things and what were the marks that made me feel something basically and movement was a very big part of it so the fact was I enjoyed the process of moving clay moving my hands moving my body and the material showing that there in front of me was an evidence of it and it was a momentary thing so I was like I captured moments all the time if you partially form your bowl, then you can rip a little bit and then you can continue. So the area to watch is in here. It's that bottom little section. Um, it, it really depends on the sort of bowl you're making and, and how you have to deal with that area. If you're trying to make something very wide, the weight of this rim that's not supported by anything here is what's going to go. So what they call the ski jump, if you've noticed that, bump that you get in a bowl is because you've pressed just a slightly too much in that spot there and there's nothing to support it. So in transitioning from the supported area to the not supported area, you have to be really careful and aware of what's happening and the outside hand that's helping needs to lift up as it does it. So you can watch yourself as you do it and say, oh okay, lift up now. If the clay's very soft, you probably don't have much time to do that particularly with the wheel, it's, it's that wetness and fluidity that matter a lot. And then it's that enjoyment I have of the wheel going round and the movement being there still. And also moving my body so that the movement is no longer a very structured, controlled movement, but I'm allowing the wheel to have a turn of speaking and the clay plasticity to have a turn and me to be engaging with the whole thing so that's that's sort of what's happening in the wheel I think and then that evolves into the looks of parts the forms of parts and trying to keep that essence going throughout the whole process right through to There's a lot to probably talk about in terms of sort of widths and proportions. Each pot's got to have solutions to it and each new design has to, you have to problem solve to get that right. And you can't know that when you first make a new, new form. You might not even know it, you might be getting something wrong for a while until you notice it in your kitchen or something and you go, it's really, it's a bit heavy looking. If you're just keeping aware of that, then that's how you can, you can end up um, improving on things. But the rules, it's not, it's not easy to make rules about it. Um, you know, should this be half that? Um, and 
is anything standing out as odd within it? If it's not, it's integrated, then it's probably okay. You know, what you're doing is okay. Um, and then just relating uh, thicknesses of things, so thickness of rim to thickness of foot to sharp edge, so that it's not really fat and round here and really sharp here. It's got this look pull through the whole, the whole thing. So that's what you need to kind of consider. And then again, this is an area you can decide, make decisions on. You want now is to create an illusion that there's feet without there being feet. And then I can, when this is a bit firmer, I can turn it over. I would reinforce that cut for cut for part by cutting upside down. I would cut a little bit more just to give it that, that lift. A lot of the surface qualities I'm trying to, to produce by the movement and the ribbing is because of what happens in the salt kiln. Um, because what I'm getting is recesses and sharpnesses that then attract or don't attract the, the glaze, the, the salt, the wood, ash, whatever. So a clean surface doesn't do the same thing. So the pots have evolved as I've got results from the kiln. I thought, oh, that's an interesting element. I'll keep that going. Wood firing and salt glazing also does the same thing as responding to the material of clay because you're responding to fire, to some things beyond yourself, to natural forces. And the results in a wood kiln, and particularly when I saw wood fired salt glaze, was like, you know, a doubling up of the of the expression that I had and an enhancing of the expression. So it just seems so logical, perfectly right. And it felt like me. I mean, I think everybody's got a different way forward, but it just seemed like, oh yeah, okay, this is, this is something I can do something with and express something about. 